Welcome to Conversations in Agriculture. Good evening. My name is Conrad Weaver. I'm your host for the program tonight, and welcome to the show. We're going to have a great conversation tonight with a farmer from Washington State. And I'll introduce her in just a moment. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about this show. So this uh, Conversations in Agriculture is a product of the American Farm Network and Conjo Studios, and I produce this show to bring farmers together with consumers to help farmers tell their stories and help consumers understand better how food is produced and how it gets to our tables. I like to eat. I like to wear clothes that are made out of, out of uh, farming products. And so I like to tell the farmer story. I personally grew up on a dairy farm. So a little background on me. I grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Ohio. My uncle and my grandfather had a dairy farm. And uh, that's where I grew up and developed a love of farming and agriculture. Uh, during my growing up years. And so recently, back in 2014, I produced a documentary called The Great American Wheat Harvest. And we followed the harvesters across the, the plains of America as they harvested wheat. And we told that story in a documentary film that's now available on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon, you can find that film. And it's about an hour and five minutes long or so. You can find it on Amazon. And and uh, it'll, it'll tell you an amazing story about these people who pack up their families and their dogs and their combines and tractors and head to Texas every summer, every May, and then they follow the harvest all the way up to North Dakota or Montana, some of them even to, into Idaho. Uh, so it's an amazing story. I think you'll enjoy it. And following that film, it led me right into producing a film called Thirsty Land. As you know, drought has impacted farming and agriculture across the western U.S., and so uh, in 2015, we filmed this story, and the photo you see there on the screen is actually the bottom of a lake in the Central Valley of California. And that was in 2015. And as we know, this year, again, it's uh, hot and dry, and fires are raging across California and impacting many folks that are working in agriculture. But tonight, we are joined by a new friend that I made a couple of weeks ago. Her name is Rosella and her husband, Burr, they own M M Mosby Mosby Farms. I'm going to mess up that name. And in the beautiful Green River outside of Auburn, Washington, and I'm going to show you this map. They are just outside of uh, Tacoma, south of Seattle, there in Washington State. And uh, Rosella has been uh, gracious to join us. And so I want to say welcome to the show. Welcome to Conversations in Agriculture. And I'm going to take you off mute so we can hear you. Welcome, Rosella. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here tonight. So just to let everybody know, we've, uh, as we know, we live in a technological world, and sometimes uh, connections aren't always the best. So you'll have to apologize. We apologize if the if the the feed is a little choppy tonight from my end or from Rosella's end. It's beyond our control. So, but I think we're going to have a great conversation. So Rosella, tell us a little bit about uh, you and how did you get into farming? So I married a farmer. That's an easy way to get into farming, right? That's a, that's a quick um, way to get into farming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I grew up, uh, we had cattle growing up as did uh, my husband. Uh, this is a first generation farm and my husband's dad left his family farm because his father who became a pharmacist wouldn't um oh no so his dad would not sell the uh mules and upgrade to a tractor <laughs> and so therefore um my father-in-law left the farm but always had a love for equipment and um so my husband ended up doing hay and and became a farmer and i came along many years later, uh, leaving my parents thinking, oh, I'll never have to put hay in a barn again, right? <laughs> and um, kind of walking away from that thought process. And and uh, yeah, so eventually our paths crossed. I have a chapter one and chapter two. And so I have a, um, we have four kids, uh, two that are older and two that are younger. And, and um, it's kind of been an interesting journey to go from having my own business um, in more of a contractor world and then marrying a farmer and then deciding that the best thing to do for our family is to give up that business and, and jump in doing the retail end of the farm, which eventually led me into the advocacy end of the farm mm. because labor on a 
hand weeded and hand harvested vegetable farm is an well, issue said, and it gets hard hand weeded and hand harvesting wow, yes so that, that's three, a lot of work three, right? <laughs> yeah 350 acres of hand weeded hand harvested vegetables and so right now a great example we're harvesting zucchini and you know how your neighbor or friend is always trying to unload zucchini on you that is because that would be me zucchini... unloading on my neighbor <laughs> <laughs> yes that's because zucchini grows a quarter of an inch per hour in the hot sun so really? if yes and so if you grow acres and acres of zucchini you have to pick that zucchini every day every other day um so we have a whole crew that pick zucchini. They start at five in the morning when it's cooler. And then they, they work until um, like probably five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, noon on a Sunday, I take them breakfast every Sunday morning. I drive out to the field. I deliver breakfast to the crew and uh, yeah, lots of zucchini. So zucchini wow. and cucumbers right now, leeks, beets, uh, rhubarb is about to come to an end. Um, yeah, so pretty soon it'll be time for pumpkins and hard squash. And, and so we're, we're trucking along. So 350 acres out of the 500 that we steward, uh, the other percentage of that, um, uh, that we're not farming is usually in cover crop or buffers next to rivers or a little bit of forestry, that kind of thing. So mm. So what's your market? Where do you sell the, the, this produce? So we sell to every uh, produce house pretty much in the Northwest or grocery chain. And um, yeah, that, it keeps us busy. We, mm. There's no, uh, no shortage of work to be done. Uh, come back to the labor issue. There's always a shortage of people. So uh, as a first generation farm, we have a, uh, a three generation family that works for us. And our old, I just always think it's a cool story to share. Our oldest part of that generation, his name is Manuel and he just turned 87 and he runs our cucumber crew. And he's like the hardest guy on the farm to work for. He has the most expectations and it's always like Manuel stop we're gonna be out there picking you know there's like so much we're all gonna it's gonna be you and me and burr and you know just six of us out there picking all this stuff so anyway uh he's he's a great guy and and his son is one of our foremen and his grandson is our mechanic and um there's some sisters and so it's kind of neat we're definitely a farm of families hmm. and um can't do it without them mm -hmm. for sure. So what is about that area of Washington that's great to grow those kind of vegetables? Is it just what you guys choose to grow or is that is that a prime area for, for what you guys do? Rhubarb, this is a great place to grow rhubarb because the uh, temperatures are mild. Uh, we're right next to the Green River. It's um, in a basin. So there's plenty of moisture, uh, water, availability isn't an issue for us uh you can always irrigate you can't buy sunshine right so <laughs> so for us um we can we can always water and so those vegetables are really good for this area because of those those reasons it's not it's not too hot we haven't had a ton of days over 80 degrees uh here this year it's been a pretty perfect summer really otherwise mm -hmm. and that's i think just from what i've talked to other people who live in you know that part of washington summers are really usually pretty nice i mean mm -hmm. they're often not too hot not too cold and of course you know seattle's known for rain right and of course the one time i visited seattle you know i was going to go sightseeing and of course it was pouring down rain and low clouds so i couldn't see anything but um yeah. i guess summers are a little better than that yeah, it's, I think that's a bit of a myth, but um, we don't, you know, let's just keep telling people that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's plenty of people, <laughs> plenty of people here already. We don't, we don't need any more people here. Yeah, I know. I was in Tacoma just uh, a year, about a year and a half ago. And wow, it, it's a, it's a busy, busy place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so Traffic. 
Yeah. Traffic is a challenge. And when you're, when you're, I mean, you're a truck farmer, right? So you harvest and then the next day you deliver your goods to Seattle or you deliver it to uh, the Kroger warehouse or the Safeway warehouse. And, and we're in close proximity to those places. And uh, we're a mile off the main highway and uh, one of the main highways. And so it, it's, um, our guys spend a little bit of time in traffic and it's, it's definitely, definitely a struggle. People, people can take a break from moving yeah. here for Not sure. Not like those farmers in Southwest Kansas that see one car every hour, you know, on the road. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, what, what is kind of your typical year like the cycle for you guys? Um, so I always think it's interesting cause you follow t Twitter groups or social media groups or, and people are like plant 2020 harvest 2020. And I'm like, okay, but we've been harvesting leaks all winter long. They're out there in their chest waders and the mud, like, you know, so they're still harvesting. And then we go into rhubarb and then, um, I want to say that's like beginning of April and then we so that's like a I spring mean, like a spring harvest yep. for, for rhubarb mm -hmm. okay. yep and so we'll go into mm -hmm. rhubarb mm -hmm. and then i mean then everything just starts coming on right and we really hit in july when we have zucchini and cucumbers and um and then we'll do cold storage beets towards fall and we're setting up for our pumpkin patch and that kind of thing and then in october after october then November hits and we're like, oh, a little bit, but you're still harvesting leeks. So mm -hmm. we kind of, we kind of harvest year round, you wow. know, and we're still pulling beets out of the cooler, washing, um, grading them out, bagging them as we sell them. And so it's, it's always busy around here. We, we employ about 25 year round and try to hire about 80 or so for about six months. Mm. So even though that's the other kind of little bit uh, kind of a misperception, I guess, is people go, oh, you're only 350 acres. You're small. Mm -hmm. But yet we still hire yeah, quite a few people, crew. right? Yeah. So you can have thousands of acres of weed or barley or what have you. But right. yet, you know, we're we're just intensive, yeah. you know. So is I guess the weather there, you don't get a whole lot of snow in the winter then? Nah, no. it'd be nice maybe to get a little bit more, but we are, um, we, snow is like an hour and a half away okay. in the mountains. More that's the, mountains. the one thing that's lovely about living here is you're close to everything. You're not far from the ocean. You're not far from the mountains. You're not far from the desert. And so, uh, you can go find snow if you want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Otherwise just... it's pretty mild. Just in my experience in Washington, it's one of my favorite states to visit and my journeys across the country. And it's so diverse. I mean, you have just about every kind of topography and landscape that you can think of, you know, from desert mm -hmm. to almost tropical in some areas. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 really, really amazing, an amazing place. Um, and we, we have such a um, span of commodities, over 300 different commodities. And I think... Wow. I think we're second to California on that. So it's a, uh, it is a beautiful place to live and we, we do, we grow all kinds of food here. So, so we're being trying a first to keep generation going. farm, I mean, how did, I guess your husband, how did he figure all this out? What to grow and how to grow? So back to the equipment. So he uh, would work on equipment with his brother hmm. and, um, and, uh, they got into doing hay, baling hay in the Ording Valley, which is kind of below Mount Rainier, I would say. It's a great, great view of Mount Rainier from the Ording Valley. And um, I think I think every first generation farmer needs a mentor, right? Sure. A really good mentor. Absolutely. And one of Burr's good mentors came um, in the form of Mrs. Vacca, who was this older Italian lady. Uh, her name actually is Italia Ciampa. Uh, she's still alive, she's 99. And she said, Burr, he rented some land from her. She said, you need to be growing things like leeks and zucchini and, and acorn squash and 
So he was like, okay. And his dad kind of leased him a piece of property and then told him about it later, kind of a thing like, hey, so I'm going to help you out here. Uh, rent's due at the end of the year. <laughs> so it really kind of, kind of forced those guys to get going, right? And um, Burr made his first delivery of acorn squash to a Safeway store in 1977 in the back of a pickup truck, oh, wow. which would never happen today. Today, mm -hmm. we have these incredible food safety requirements. Everything has to be delivered for the most part in a refrigerated van and has to have harvest logs and who harvested it and what time it was harvested and what field it came out of and which rows it came out of and the boxes have to be stamped and stickered and with all of that history. And so um, he's been working towards building a farm ever since. And so when I look around and see what he's done here, uh, his brother wasn't around for a ton of time. He went on to work at a John Deere dealership and got involved in management and ended up owning that store. So he kind of left the farm and did something else. But I, I, I wasn't around for the, all of the running a tractor till midnight with the headlights on and eating lettuce out of the field. Cause that's what you could afford and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I came around later and, and uh, I'm, I watched from afar. Mm -hmm. We we grew up a couple miles apart from each other, and and his younger sister went to school with my older brother, and we're a few years apart. But we we knew of each other, and our circles, um, circles of people knew each other. But we we didn't really um, hang out together or anything. So mm -hmm. we had we had talked for. I don't know, 13 years or so, but we hadn't really, hadn't really been social before until we started dating. So I don't know. It's kind of a cool story. Yeah, it is a cool story. What are some of your, your biggest challenges that you have? Um, I would say labor is our biggest challenge uh, and regulations. Uh, labor, the labor thing is tough. I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions there. Uh, I think farms um aren't successful at the end of, i mean it takes it takes all of us as a team working together to accomplish our goals and if you if you're if you're not taking care of your people they're not going to stick around mm -hmm. and we we make a lot of effort to take care of our people and and you know if there's that you know, extra stuff we send home with them and we, we want them to come back and we want, we want them to work hard and we work hard. And, you know, my husband's the last one to go home every day. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if a pipe breaks and we have to dig a hole, like he's, he's right there digging a hole with them and there's no job that he hasn't done. And my kids, my, all of my kids, all four kids work on the farm and they work right next to our crew and, and, uh, labor, labor's a big thing for fresh market produce in a big way. Um, the regulatory challenges i would say the biggest regulatory challenge is probably consistency mm. between um between agencies uh i know for us it's not as big as maybe for like the dairy industry where you have one agency saying do do it this way and another one saying it oh no you have to do it this way but even within i mean a great example is our we had on-site retail which we got out of about six years ago because of some county regulations, but yet our food safety regulations when it comes to testing water and such, I mean, we were totally in the realm of where we should be. And so it didn't meet the county's requirements. And, you know, it, so at the end of the day, we weren't going to drill a well and put in a water treatment system to keep a, store open that's only open half a year yeah you know it doesn't make financial right. sense sure. to do that sure wow is it do you think it's uh it does the state have additional regulations besides what's on local and then what, whatever you have from the federal government yeah yeah so uh yeah and it depends 
you know, you have, we have a lot of water here and we have salmon and orca and, and so <clears throat> you have just these, um, oh, you have people making decisions that are more emotional based, I would say, or they're, um, like, a they're more like tight your heartstrings, right? Based than than being practical. So one big issue in Washington State is removing the dams mm -hmm. in eastern Washington. And in order to move the wheat that those barges move, mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be like 40,000 truckloads a day. Right. So we're going to take out these dams where the barges move all of this wheat, but yeah, we're going to put 40,000 more trucks on the road. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have, we don't have enough truck drivers. Think of the fuel costs, right. think of the exhaust out of those trucks. And the noise. so <laughs> the road noise and all yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Kind of so kind of more, yeah, yeah, kind of more symbolism versus substance. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of struggling on the, uh, struggling on the practicality of some of those decisions. Wow. And two, I think, I think when you over regulate, uh, especially in agriculture, we're just building barriers for new people to get involved. And the reality is we have an aging workforce, we have an aging farmer, and for a new farmer to come along and say, hey, I think I want to get into agriculture right now, it'd be tough. It'd be yeah, tough. I mean, it's tough enough to look at your second generation and say, hey, you should do what we do. It's great. <laughs> like all the stress, you get to sign your life away every year on a bank loan and hope you can pay it back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so they're like, sure, mom. <laughs> no thanks, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So and then we're working how many hours and and wait, we have to do what now? Because they changed the rules. And so it's. I don't know. Like yeah. at some point, I think at some point, I think that comes down to the consumer mm -hmm. and the consumer needs to be aware of the challenges so that they're putting more pressure on the people to hold office. I mean, you come back to labor and I don't, I don't hold, when you think about labor and the last policy update, to our H2A system. We don't, or our H2A program. We don't use H2A because we're a first generation farm. We're in King mm -hmm. County, the same county as Seattle. It's expensive to build housing. It took us three years to get a well and septic permit for a barn we were building. I mean, to build worker housing would be kind of uh, a daunting experience mm -hmm. besides it being expensive. But, but you, you haven't had a policy update since 1986. And so that's before that's before the desktop computer and mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about agriculture being expected to use like highest tech for efficiency, like modern um, modern advances, you know, work harder, don't work harder, work smarter, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Like we're not we're not um, we're not helping our labor issue by not addressing some of the the policy problems that go with um a program like h2a mm. and i think it's not necessarily like the presidents that have held office it's all the other people that have been there for quite a few years who've had lots of opportunities to solve the issue that haven't mm -hmm. keeps getting put on the back burner mm. I'm, I'm i'm so I've got the website pulled up because you're you're still freezing up a little bit, so I'm giving people some some photos from your farm to to scroll through. So uh, it was weird because earlier you were you were coming through just fine, and then all of a sudden you froze up again. So rather than just looking at a frozen image of your face, I decided to show some of the some <laughs> of the farm photos. So uh, so we apologize for the viewers out there. Uh, no, nope. we can't uh, we can't control the technology here. So uh, that's kind of what happens. Yeah. Um, so rural what, broadband the priority yeah rural broadband <laughs> yeah is, is yeah. A, a challenge right and and what's, yeah. what's crazy you know if you look at the map look where you're located you know you're uh you're like 40 right minutes there in, from microsoft yeah exactly yeah exactly <laughs> so it's yeah like, 
you know, you're right here, right in the middle of, you know, the high tech world, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a good rural broad, you know, broadband there. So, yeah. Yeah. We have, um, we have a satellite on the barn. We have a satellite on the house. I have a hotspot in my office and this is on its own mobile, you know, uh, mm -hmm. little Wi-Fi thing. So it, it's, mm -hmm. it is, we spend a lot of money on trying to be connected here. Yeah. in an efficient so, way so what do you do i know you're you you work with a number of organizations what do you do as an ambassador for for agriculture what, what's your role in that so um how you found me and a new thing to me i'm kind of excited about uh the farm journal foundation mm -hmm. is um a wonderful organization working on food security issues and research and uh, so super excited to be a new and the first Washington State ambassador. Well, congratulations and on that. Thank you. I'm uh, learning a little bit myself. I think there's 22 across the nation. I think there's 22 states uh, that have ambassadors and um, things like you know, food security research that helps food security. Uh, we um, in Washington State have uh, the little cherry disease, which isn't getting any funding right now. Um, I have a friend that pulled out 13,000 uh, cherry trees. And wow. yeah, so it, and it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, they don't, they don't know how to uh, remedy the issue. So, mm -hmm. so it's, um, and you, once you pull it out, you can't put another tree there because the issue is then in the soil and it will mm -hmm. just infect the new tree. So, so what do they do? do? They have to just follow that land then or? Uh, yeah, it, there's, there are farmers over there who've pulled out all their trees and they are just selling their property. So, wow. and that's like, I mean, I don't know if you've eaten Washington cherries, they're pretty good. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's an export mm -hmm. thing too. We, all the nice, beautiful, big cherries go to Japan and other countries and, and we kind of get the mm -hmm. little bit of the leftovers here. They're still good though. Um, so issues like that. Um, and then there's all kinds of, uh, research done across the country and then globally too. So I'm learning and I look forward to becoming a better ambassador for, uh, the farm journal foundation, super involved in farm bureau. Um, uh, so I'm on the state board and uh, the state executive committee, and um, I am always a person to say that as a farmer getting involved in any farm organization that is advocating for your right to farm and your ability to do that successfully is um, worth your time. And just working on policy issues and trying to uh, solve those issues in a collaborative way, finding common ground with people that may not agree with you is uh, a challenge, but most definitely a worthy endeavor. So I enjoy those things. I can say that I have made some really great friends across the country um, through being involved in farm advocacy work and I'm thankful for that. The one thing too is that uh, as a vegetable farmer, I don't always know other issues in other sectors of the industry. And so having those connections and being able to call my dairy farming friends and say, hey, somebody asked me this question, what is the answer? Or my cherry growing friend, what is the answer? Mm -hmm. um, I think we work better when we're collaborative and uh, there's, there's a big difference between supporting our agriculture in the United States from the soil up versus the box up. Hmm. And so when we are, you know, I, I already said you can't export without importing, right? But, you know, let's import plenty of pineapples and mangoes and papayas and mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that we definitely need to keep our um, agriculturalists that are stewarding our land here uh, able to continue to do that job well and staying afloat versus uh, thriving 
is um, I think a big challenge for agriculture right now, mm -hmm. probably the biggest challenge for agriculture right now. Mm -hmm. And when you're thriving on a farm, you're able to take what you've built and put it back into your farm. And whether that is upgrading your equipment or trying, um, trying something new. I mean, look at the robotics industry and all the cool things happening there. And we do have, they don't come out and solve our broadband uh, Wi-Fi issue, but they want to come out and measure our cultivators, right? <laughs> so we do have these techie people who like to come out and they measure tractors and they measure uh, the implements behind the tractor. So we'll have one that cultivates zucchini and everything has its own setup. And so they'll measure those things um, and they want to take that information back and create something fabulous that, you know, we hope to maybe be able to afford someday. So, yeah. you know, I talked to, and I'm going to make this announcement later, but I talked to someone today from Iowa and he, he was talking about how, you know, just this, the normal challenges of growing row crops in that part of the country is, is just barely marginally successful. I mean, they're usually, and, and even in the, in the cattle industry as well, they're, they're, you know, it, it's, it's actually costs more than it does to what, what they get a return, you know, mm -hmm. it costs more to produce those things than it does to get a return. And so how can a farmer be sustainable and continue mm -hmm. to provide, you know, good quality food for the world? when you can't make a living. I mean, if Starbucks were, you know, if, if their, their five dollar coffee were costing them six bucks, <laughs> Starbucks would not be around, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's what farmers are doing. They're selling a five dollar coffee, you know, and, and it's costing them six bucks. Yeah. Oh, yes. So <laughs> our, <laughs> so much right about everything you just said. Uh, yes, so we, um, in Washington state, our, our minimum wage keeps going up and which we all, I say we, cause collectively it passed, we voted for that. Right. And, uh, our minimum wage, which we pay more than minimum wage, except for our youth group, we do hire kids and they do make minimum wage cause they're 15 to 18 and half of them don't know how to use a push broom. So they're only worth minimum wage at this point. <laughs> so, um, our minimum wage has gone up like four bucks in the last four ish years. And our product cost, what we're getting back has gone down hmm. or gone up maybe a dollar at the most. Wow. And so when you weigh that out, you know, you have to think, okay, well, the propane guy's charging more, the tire guy's charging more, the fuel guy's charging more. The, I mean, everybody's charging more, right? The boxes cost more. Each zucchini box costs $1.75. So that costs more. E everything is more. Um, so so how, how do you, yeah, like I've heard you say farmers are some of the smartest people I know. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, I don't know. Maybe there, maybe we have a couple of flaws. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think I'm thinking, um, hold on a second. I, I, it's, it's that like we're glutton for punishment, maybe a little bit. We keep coming back for more. Like right. people think, oh, it's a lifestyle. You're living this lifestyle. Well, hold on a second. We're a business first. Mm -hmm. The lifestyle is the perk that comes with that business. Um, and none of it exists without success. Sure. which depends on uh, some luck, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, risk management, right, is a right. big thing. Yep. Uh, and um, a little trust in Mother Nature, which <laughs> I'm sure people across the country right now are like, oh, yeah, Mother Nature, I have a, I have a different name for her today, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but there's a lot of things that that we have to deal with. You have tech and markets and food safety and soil and water quality and rivers and labor issues and um, budgets and rising overhead and dwindling profits and all of these things all while we're trying to be good stewards of the land, right? And feed people. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, 
you have people calling saying, oh, hey, so can you donate for this? And can you donate that? And can you, you know, and we, we are huge. We donate huge amounts of, of uh, product to our local food banks because we live in a really, um, actually Auburn, the town we live in is one of the least healthy cities in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. And we, so we send as much produce in boxes that cost a dollar seventy-five that we've already paid labor to harvest. That would normally, if that opportunity wasn't there, that food would go into Arnie's uh, compost pile down across the bridge for his replacement heifers. You know, but we want to feed people with that, mm -hmm. and and so we're we're not a nonprofit. We're not a charity. At the end of the day, we're a business. We're trying to. Um, have enough to reinvest to keep us going to make it to that next generation there's no dad and like dad might assign on that first lease but it's been a hell of a lot of work to get where we are you know or for burr to get where he is i wasn't there for all that beginning stuff and so you know trying to get to that second generation where your kids you hope somebody right says oh i want to do it and um I don't know. That's the big goal. And and the and the thing is, someone has to do it because there's people to feed, right? Yeah. 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 And the and people too, like when they think about um, so you have they don't always make that connection. So us farming here in Auburn and we're so close to Seattle. So that's a 25 minute delivery. Uh, it, depending on traffic, we already covered traffic, right? <laughs> so um, we have another warehouse that's nine miles away, another one that's 14 miles away. So when we're not in season, that same product, those zucchini or those cucumbers, they start in the south, right? They're growing in Mexico and then they come up just like it does every year. So you'll have product that comes from, eventually comes from California and then it comes from Oregon and then it comes into our time. and but when you think about that carbon footprint on that on that food that's coming to our region, we're worth keeping alive. We're worth keeping in business because we're stewarding the land. We're providing local food for our people. We are, um, you know, we're planting cover crops. We're, you know, we're doing all of these things to try to uh, to try to do the job well. And, and so I think, I think collectively in agriculture, sometimes we have a narrative problem, you know, where we all, we all just need to come together and say, Hey, you know, this is what we're doing and it's good. And, you know, and, and, and stop kind of going, you know, I mean, we always feel like we're on an island because we grow organic and we grow conventional. And so the organic people look at you like you have three heads and the organic people look at you like you have right. three heads sometimes. And it's like, oh, we're just growing for our market, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you put in extra work, you should get paid extra money. And if we got to make all these extra logs and do all this extra work to grow organic, you know, somebody's always going to buy better cheese and better wine and better mm -hmm. shoes sure. or boots or right. what have you. And so... Food choices are a blessing. Yeah, for sure. You know, I've been to some places where they don't have food choices. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, you go to the market and there's not much there. Or there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's one, there's rice or there's rice and beans. And you have rice and beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, yeah. you know, those, uh, we're, we're blessed here in the U.S. to have, I can go to my supermarket here in Maryland and get California potatoes, I mean, California in, in tomatoes or whatever it, you know, I can get Washington apples or I can get, you know, things from parts of the world that I can get bananas from South America, even though they were harvested when they were green, but <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But, um, right. <laughs> but we can get this food that is, you know, fresh and healthy and, and we have an amazing system. I know my friend, A.G. Kawamura, always talks about the transportation system we have in the U.S. of how we can ship, you know, he, he, he's in Orange County in, in California, and he said, I can ship my, my strawberries and my beans, you know, to the East Coast. And in two days, they can be over there, and someone can have fresh strawberries and fresh beans. You know, what mm -hmm. other country 
you know, in, in history has this kind of transportation, uh, you know, and for relatively cheap and, and we complain about rising food prices, you know, we go to the grocery store and things have doubled and tripled and since COVID started, but mm-hmm. it hasn't helped you guys. Right. <laughs> I mean, no, we we've been keeping busy because we're packing the USDA um, farm to families boxes. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of helped fill our gap a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but like one of our one of our um, buyers has contracts with cruise ships. Those aren't mm-hmm. happening right now. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, um, I don't you know, and that comes that comes into like all of the labeling and stuff too. Starving people do not care what the label says on the package. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we are, um, well, yeah, it's great to have food choices. And if you do the extra work as a farmer, you should get paid for that extra work. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, not have food choices for everybody. And um it, it the the food insecurity issue is uh is a um is close to us here just because of where we live and in the town in which we live and so we kind of we see it you know mm. so so what's yeah, what's the next big thing for on. you guys what what's coming up next in your your season Ha! <laughs> so our governor uh, put out some mandates uh, a couple days ago that are really restricting pumpkin patches and our ability to operate them. So we are Is that because um, of COVID. We're, yes, hmm. and we're trying to figure that out. So here we are. We're open air, but you um, can't. You have to have like one way pads, and you can't go into the corn maze. And I mean, there's hmm. just the list is is a real bummer for agriculture all across the state and so we are uh trying to figure that out and um you know it's a year unlike any other Mm uh i i don't even i don't even know what to say about this year as i'm sure most farmers don't it's um i think it will be interesting to see how it all shakes out and how uh how maybe our food system might alter a little bit i suspect that it might alter a little bit and i really really hope that consumers get more engaged uh when you are a consumer and you go into a store and you see limits on how many gallons of milk you can buy or empty shelves of any kind Mm -hmm. that should be concerning to everybody and so, um, I don't know. For us, we're just we're just trying to hang in there, you know. First generation, so we're we're um, we are dealing with all of our first generation growing pains, and still trying to grow food for people. And mm-hmm. and we just really pray next year is a new beginning. <laughs> uh, don't we all, right? Just to get through this. Year. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think what, that's a common theme. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's like okay, what's next? You know, here we had two hurricanes coming toward the the Gulf of Mexico this this week, and you know, so what's next? You know, a three headed lizard yeah. or something going to invade? Um, it's been a crazy year, but uh, I want to say for me, you know, thank you for doing what you're doing because uh, I mean, my hats off to farmers everywhere. Uh, just because of the, the challenges of the nature of the business. And, you know, you talked about how it's a business first and, and, you know, and you do it for the love, right? You do it to yeah, to earn a living, to, to support your family, to support the community, to support, you know, to feed people, but ultimately you love it. You have to love it to keep going back to it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if, if you wouldn't love it, I guess it would be, uh, You'd be Sarah and I, you'd be you'd be checking out and you know working in computers uh, or something. So <laughs> about a year ago, I have broadband. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell the story because it, it cracked us up at the time. So Henry's our youngest and he's twelve right now. And about a year ago, he says, "Geez, Dad," he goes, "I love living here." He goes, 
this, it's so great. And he goes, we get to be out here in nature. And he goes, you know, he goes, I am really glad. He goes, you know, you could have been an accountant and we could be living in an apartment somewhere. And we just cracked up later because we were thinking, oh, yeah, hey, you could have been an accountant. We could be on that three week vacation somewhere like fabulous on a beach in the summertime because, you know, I mean, we work all summer. Right. And so from April to October, we're slammed and and we just were laughing because we thought, oh, here's this perspective that we don't always have. Like we're working super hard and here's your 11 year old saying he could have been an accountant, dad, and we could be living, you know, like his, his uh, idea of what an accountant is like totally was inaccurate in my mind, but at the same time, he totally had appreciation in that moment for where we live and what we do. That's so awesome. you might have a second generation yeah. there coming up, right? <laughs> yeah, I think a couple of them, you know, yeah. we're, there's good days and bad days because they're 25, 22, 13 and 12. And so yeah. they're, you know, and everybody has an opinion on how things should be done, including the 13 year old. And so <laughs> we're, you know, we're always in debate around here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been it's a lot of fun talking to you and learning about what you guys do there in, in Washington. It's uh, uh, thanks for coming on the show and for for doing what you're doing. I'm serious that I always say that farmers are some of the smartest people I know and and you, you're one of those. And so thank you for being persistent and continuing to bring quality food to the market for for people there in in Western Washington. So yeah um, thank you comrade yeah. i appreciate that absolutely well we have been talking with rosella mosby is, is that how you say your last name i, I was yeah I was mosby afraid it's gonna mess it up and nope. she and her husband have mosby farms there in auburn washington and uh it's been a pleasure talking to to you and i wish you guys the very best and success in uh, this season and and may 2020 be even better I mean, 2021. 2021. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think we're all hoping for that, Conrad. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody just hang on for just a minute. Roselle, just hang on for just a minute. I'm going to give an announcement about who's coming on next week. I had a great conversation today with Craig Hill. He's the president of the Iowa Farm Bureau. And we talked about the derecho storm that happened a couple of weeks ago and devastated more than 10 million acres of Iowa crops. And we talked at length about what the Farm Bureau is doing, what the government's doing to help farmers, and what farmers are doing to help farmers to recoup and to recover and to get their farms working back again. So that will be next week, next Monday, 8 p.m. Be sure to come by and watch that video. It's going to be it's an amazing conversation. I, I know you'll enjoy it. And if you can, please share it with your network, your friends and family and neighbors and enemies and anyone else who 